Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome in the last session of this Smarty Summer School series on uh, the art of insighting. I just came back myself from a three-week holiday, so I'm very happy that I can experience this last Smarty session uh, with all of you. Um, just one more practical thing, when you have questions during the session, you can ask them in the community chat on the left, and then afterwards, um, Ashley will be happy to answer the questions for you. So, um, our presenter for today is Ashley Smith, and he's a business director uh, here at Insights Consulting. So, Ashley, when you're ready, you can take over from here. Enjoy the session, everyone. Great. Thank you, Natalie. Um, I hope everybody can hear me loud and clear. If you can't, just give me a sign. Um, and indeed, Alexander, um, it, the summer is disappearing, but I do believe it's going to hang around for a couple more weeks. So uh, I'm the eternal optimist. Uh, I'm hoping for an Indian summer uh, for this year. Um, so welcome, everybody, uh, to the webinar today uh, on how to generate new insights and make them work for your business and brands in today's world. Um, so the next hour we will recap briefly on a bit of theory about insights, but I want to spend more of our time today actually on how you can officially get to insights um, and how to activate them for your business to get the most um, value from them. So just before we launch into it, um, I'd just like to mention that as this is the summer school, uh, the program today is very much a complete rerun um, of an art, art of insighting webinar that myself uh, and my colleague Martin uh, had uh, conducted uh, later last year. So um, I realize we're all very busy people. So if you're expecting a completely new program today, um, if you had already tuned into that previous, um, uh, let's say, Smarties last year, just to give you a heads up that um, the content is more or less um, uh, a replay of, uh, of what we have done there. So um, moving along, uh, those who don't know me, uh, I'm actually a uh, displaced Australian, having lived and worked in many uh, parts of Europe and the world. Um, but I'm actually very passionate about inciting innovation. Um, although FMCG is currently my main focus, I have a general uh, love for um, projects which are designed around inciting and then leading into brand or product innovation. Um, you see a bit of my family on screen there. Uh, but actually, to get me to know me a little bit better, I just thought I would put on screen a insight, which is a bit, I would say, one of my insights that I uh, feel and believe. Uh, so if you read this insight, um, maybe you could just um, tell me what you think has happened in terms of products or solutions that might have actually answered this particular insight. And for those who don't know, if you need to type anything, you can type in the chat box. And I'm curious to hear what you think the products and services are that solve this particular insight of mine. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if people in five years will even um, know what a DVD is. It's dying very fast. Yeah, and Netflix. Yeah, okay. Precisely. I, I, I would say that these two products are exactly offerings which have, in a way, answered, or in a very good way, answered my particular insight. Uh, and more on that later, uh, as our theme is on consumer insighting uh, today. So why did we have this originally have this webinar um, about a year ago? Was that actually we saw that we're doing a lot of insight generation projects, and we're learning a lot as we do them. Um, so we wanted to share things uh, with you, but also we saw that Insight generation was an art form. It's something that took uh, a lot of tools, but also um, a special way of thinking to get to great insights and to get to um, new and fresh insights. Uh, so that's the purpose of what we wanted to do. Um, and as I said before, we had even before uh, last year's uh, webinar, we've even done previous seminars or webinars where we have talked about why consumer insights are important. So my proposal today was not to recap this um, in great detail, is to more or less assume that um, all of you are, uh, let's say, convinced about the value of consumer insights to modern businesses, about the need to discover them, about the need to use them um, to support our key innovations, brands, uh, communications, etc. Uh, so we won't go too much into the why we need to do this. Um, having said that, I would like to spend just a few minutes 
uh, going back to school. I think the kids are going back to school next week. I will be partially happy when that happens. Uh, but um, yes, back to school for the kids and maybe back to school a little bit for us today on consumer insights and a bit, a bit about the theory, at least from our point of view. Um, maybe uh, we, we realise that consumer insights or insighting is something that um, has many, many different definitions among those of you in the, in the industry of what is an insight, what is not. Um, we will talk about our vision on that very shortly, but maybe just a type um, for you. What do you think a, an insight is? Um, you can use just words or short sentences, but what's an insight for you? What do you, what do you think it is? What, is? what does it have to have? What's it about? Okay, so we see the concept of conciseness, yeah, underneath the skin, deep understanding, dilemma or a problem, okay, good, good. All right, I think that's already a good start. Actually, yeah, I'd say all of those answers contain elements which are part of the story and more on that later, but um, it's good to hear your, your opinions on that uh, before I start to tell you our story on this. And actually the way we tend to um, describe this is, is a better way to do it is actually to talk about what an insight is not uh, in terms of um, certain well talked about um, aspects in the industry. So because it is a very, very overused word and sometimes not um, completely understood in the context of what we think it should be. So one of the first things we say is that um, an insight is not just an observation. And as we'll see in a minute, um, insights are more than just seeing things, uh, noticing things, it's about feeling it and understanding it. Uh, so what is happening, but also why it is happening. Uh, we need to get to that deeper understanding. Uh, Dennis talked about underneath the skin, but indeed the idea of observing obviously things or noticing things, but going deeper to understand why it is happening and how it's important and or not important to people. So an insight is more than just an observation. And um, yeah, something which is very much in the, let's say, in the um, uh, forefront of people's minds right now is about the idea of data and big data. Well, big data is absolutely useful. It's definitely great to have, but um, is big data on its own an actual insight according to us? Well, not there yet. Uh, so an, a, a real uh, let's say potent insight for us is beyond observations or data. Um, uh, so big data is not yet uh, what we would consider um, a complete insight. Another, um, let's say, uh, discussion point is about whether insights um, only lead to one idea uh, or one product idea or one communication idea. Now generally we think that a great insight is something that should actually be the mother or the father of many different ideas, be it innovation ideas, um, or branding or communication ideas. It shouldn't necessarily be one insight to one product and that's it. Uh, we've seen insights which have fed entire product lines or divisions for, for years. Now on screen you all know probably the, the ladies on the left um, from the Dove, uh, the Dove campaign or, commun or positioning of, of already nearly 10 years ago. Um, but the idea that the insight can be used and can be reused um, is explained by the, uh, the picture on the right hand side, which was their attempt around seven or eight years later to reactivate um, this insight in a different way. Um, what's going on there is that the, uh, the sketch on the left is actually um, a lady who's uh, described uh, herself to a sketch artist, and that's what the sketch artist has actually uh, painted. The sketch on the right is actually how the sketch artist views the lady uh, without any briefing or bias from the lady himself, herself. So to again show that often uh, we are not, um, uh, let's say, as aware or alert to how, how beautiful or how in, the inner beauty that we have ourselves. So it was another way to show the um, same insight they started with but executed in a, in a, in a fresh and new way some eight uh, years later. At Insights Consulting, we do believe um, there is a kind of a, let's say, a, a cookbook or a recipe book for, for great insights. To provide insights, a better experience, uh, we're saying tourism, we want the people that uh, come I'm going to go say, that reasonably was... quickly through these because I want to move into insight generation. Uh, but the building blocks are as such. Um, it's me. Well, I think you okay, would not, not be surprised sure by this, there, uh, will, course, that an insight needs to be recognisable and relevant to the consumer. From. So really tapping into their life. 
um, it should really trigger a reaction that you really understand me. So when a consumer or a customer hears a particular insight, they they say, yes, that's very much me. I recognize that situation. To provide a better experience, this. we're saying tourism. We want the, the second ingredient, to um, the idea of aha, is a little bit more, uh, let's say, uh, theoretical, but uh, important. And that's the idea that yeah, a good or great okay, insight can sure be one which there. is actually will, bringing course, something to the surface that was subconsciously there uh, in, the, in the mind of a consumer. Or in other words, when they hear a particular insight, they say, ah, that's true, yes, I, 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 I recognize what you're saying, but I haven't really been thinking about that. It hasn't been in the forefront of my mind. Uh, the analogy of a, of a light going off in a, in a um, refrigerator when you open the door, the light goes off in the consumer's mind saying, yes, you've uncovered something that's true and actually I hadn't really been thinking about it that much, but still very fresh and new way of looking at, uh, at my situation. And the final element, um, the, if you remember the heart on our, let's say, cookbook for a great, uh, good or great insight was the desire, the emotional desire um, to have actually uh, the situation change. So you probably uh, well aware that a normally a great insight contains, uh, and actually it was mentioned uh, by Jelena, um, that a great insight contains typically a dilemma or a problem or a situation they want to, um, that, that, that needs to be changed. And of course a great insight has to have something that they do want to have changed. So a weaker insight may be true, the context, but the actual desire to change may not be very strong. And that could affect the ability for that to be a great insight to activate for your brand um, or business. So, wrapping up, you see a little on screen um, how we look at, um, let's say, the, the building blocks or ingredients of a great insight. And then that should actually unlock great business potential for marketing teams leading to competitive advantage. So before we move into, um, uh, let's say, the generation of insights and our model we have on that, um, a, little, a quick quiz. It's not a difficult quiz. I'd still like to run it, and and actually you just need to type uh, again in the in the box your A, B, or C answer to this. So let's do a quick quiz. Um, what is this? Uh, the volume of coffee consumption among 18 to 25 year old consumers is declining for two years now. Is that a hypothesis? Is it an observation or an insight? Okay. Yeah, yeah. The wisdom of the crowd is prevailing. Yeah, we have a lot of bees, and indeed, um, we would say that that is a pure observation. So um, actually, that is obviously interesting, as I'll explain in a minute, and definitely worth taking note of. But what we are missing is that deep understanding of why this is happening and how important it is for people to have this managed or supported or solved. Uh, next question: uh, What is this statement? A, B, or C. Yes, we have very much a cons pretty much a consensus here, and I can say yes, you're all smart cookies. Uh, that is a hypothesis. Um, what it has done is it's taken the, the observation we were we were just looking at, and it's an it's been an interpretation of that behaviour. It's an exp potential explanation why. Um, it's likely that this has not yet been proven through research, uh, but it's an attempt to take the observation and um, try to explain the motivation or the behavior that's why it's happening there. And the third one uh, on screen, what is this? Now the little trick, I've put a little trick in here with the A, Bs and Cs. just to see that you were paying attention. <laughs> yeah, okay. So actually, um, yes, I believe this is uh, what we would call an insight. And I did switch around a bit the, the order of the A, Bs and Cs. But um, what you notice about this is that it's, a, it's um, an attempt now to actually wrap everything up in a nice consumer, uh, let's say consumer focused statement, which underlies a or outlines a situation um, where there is uh, a context, uh, a desire to have something changed, and it's very much spoken as if as, uh, written as if spoken by a consumer. You notice the use of the words I, the language used, all consumer language, 
um, and in a clear kind of concise statement of a, of a need there. So we would consider that to be um, an insight. Um, when you have insights, we believe it's just a starting point. Obviously, they're, they're like gold to have in your organization. Um, but it's a beginning of, of many things. And I mean, the most obvious is it can be the DNA of a great product innovation. Um, on screen, you see a Dyson, uh, a Dyson vacuum cleaner, one of their range. And um, people often think that this was, you know, this is just created because it's cool and we could do it. But uh, there, is a, there is an insight behind this product and it does involve the fact that the, the, the clear plastic, uh, let's say, dust collecting unit that you see there actually um, is centered on an insight that uh, consumers really do want to see the dirt being picked up by cleaning products. And the reason for that is that it's, uh, let's say, a reassurance to them that the cleaning is, is being done correctly. Because cleaning itself is actually centered in, in often an emotional need to present your house or your room or your, or, your, or your office in a very clean light, which reflects yourself as a character as well. So the idea about uh, making sure that the cleaning products are doing their job well um, can be um, an emotional issue. So that's what this product actually, re let's say, reassures the consumer of is that, yeah, this product is collecting dirt and is doing a great job to send it on an insight. And we also believe that great insights should find a way into every touch point. They should, there should be a way to activate those insights and more on that later. Um, Mini is a, is, a, is a brand that does this very well in terms of the idea of being different and, and unconventional shaking things up, uh, finding its way into a lot of their communications and a lot of their consumer touch points. So using an insight, uh, leveraging it well uh, in your business. Um, and we're often um, having discussions with customers and clients about insights. And there's a tendency to think that insights are only related to product um, innovation and packaging innovation. But no, insights can be for different purposes. You can have brand communication insights, shopper insights. Um, Generally, the DNA of them is the same, but there's a the slight difference in the content or the story being told um, as I put on the screen there. Um, these are not hard and fast rules, but just to say, yeah, inciting is not only always about finding insights for product, new products or services. It can be for other purposes as well. Okay, and actually what we think um, is underpinning that process of getting to a great insight is a little bit linked to the quizzes and what we've just discussed is that it starts with observations. Observations are very, very useful. Observations are definitely not um, to be discarded, but we need to, to, to kind of build ourselves from observations through to, to great insights. And along the way, we add the level of hypothesis as we've just discussed. Um, and we also then eventually validate and confirm and, and explore these um, hypotheses with consumers. Now, um, people often say, well, what is, a, um, what is a clue? You see, I mentioned here about a, a meaningful observation. And what we're talking about there is looking in all the data and all the, uh, let's say, all the consumer research and observation you're doing, how do I look for the things which are really likely to lead to great insights? So the idea of a meaningful observation is something we, we would like to put forward. And, well, what is that? Um, now, there's no hard and fast rules for that, but here's some, some ideas for you. Um, what could make an observation interesting about a consumer? Well, the first one would be emotion. So if you, if you see that consumers are talking about an issue or a problem with very emotional language, um, that could be a sign that it's something that's really important to them or something that needs to be, needs to be fixed. Uh, repetition is pretty obvious. If something is being said again and again and again by consumers, then it's, it's clearly a need that needs to be resolved or has not been adequately resolved by the marketplace to this point. Frictions are great if you can see in the data or the observations that people are wanting to do something but are being held back or restricted from doing what they want, then that is already a great step towards a, a high potency, uh, let's say, consumer insight. Saying and doing is very interesting. Uh, consumers will often say that this is what I want and this is how I will do things, but when you observe them, they actually do things differently. And that can be, from a research point of view, very interesting to explore further to see if you can indeed find a potential friction. And finally, surprise is just as you as a researcher or as a marketeer or a brand owner, et cetera, it's just any observations or consumer behavior that surprises you personally. That can make an observation very interesting. So these are the kind of some tips on when you're looking at um, the starting point of inciting what uh, observations to pay attention to. And I put a couple of examples on the screen here, but I won't really spend a lot of time on that. I'll just pick on one. Um, I put up on the top right the idea about strong language and emotions. Um, 
you know, a comment like, I really hate it when I have to pick up my kids from the school, it's like a war zone. It's so emotionally loaded with language and, 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 and the language that it suggests that this is really an issue for, for parents, uh, that's something they would like to have solved. So just an example there. Um, as Natalie says, I'm going to collect your questions. Uh, we'll come back, Dennis, to your question um, at the end. Uh, so we'll keep that uh, uh, on ice for now. So before I move into our model, uh, actually the idea that we as an, an agency are trying to, let's say, discuss with our, with our customers and clients is the idea about insighting is not necessarily something that just happens uh, for a little while and stops. And it's not something that only certain people in the company do. There's an idea that that insights can be collected or generated by market intelligence and so forth. But we, want, we believe that finding insights or be, being able to find insights could be the responsibility of everyone in the company. It could be done everywhere and any time. And that also that we should not just look at one particular source of consumer information to get at to our insights, that many other insight, uh, say data sources, can be useful here. Um, and we'll give some examples uh, on that in just a minute. Now the model for today, uh, for those who, that are uh, new to um, our virtuous circle, um, is on screen and I'll go through the, actually the rest of the webinar we're going to go through the, the five blocks. Um, I know models, we, we, we present models a lot, I don't want this to be seen as like the model, it's just a way of trying to articulate how we see um, a holistic way to go about um, inciting in your company. Um, I picked that virtuous, I've, I've got some definitions uh, and some uh, from the dictionary and thesaurus and so forth. Um, some key aspects about something being virtuous is, uh, I would say, something that is um, exemplary, that is um, uh, excellent, is high principle. So the idea here is about an inciting, let's say, um, vision for your business, which is meeting those um, requirements of being exemplary, excellent, and high principled. And here are the different stages. Um, now, we can look at these, um, I've, obviously, they've got numbers around them. So we could look at this as something that is very uh, much a sequential process, but um, I think that's too simplistic. This is also something that can be independent activities happening at different times. I think the key thing is that we believe all of these uh, five, let's say, um, uh, pillars uh, are important in the business. And we'll go through them, each of them now to explain, uh, give more detail on why that is. So the first one is bottom-up listening. Um, now, many of you will probably guess what this is about, um, but essentially what we mean is that any kind of tool or source or process that can be utilized to capture what we call unsolicited discussions or observations. Um, this is often because consumer insights can be relatively hidden and it can be difficult to capture them with just traditional question and answer, question and answer. Um, so we need to go beyond just asking questions and actually observing and listening um, in an ongoing mode. Now one of the ways, modern ways that this happens a lot is through online consumer communities uh, or, or panels where consumers are talking to each other. Um, and the idea here is that part of these, um, let's say, platforms involve uh, a lounge or they involve an area where consumers can just organically talk to them among themselves. Obviously questions and answers are being um, posed or tasks are being posed, but there is still kind of a bottom-up organic discussion uh, going on uh, within these environments. You see an example here of a typical consulting board or online uh, community. And as I said, uh, these communities will have actual structured and focused tasks and questions, but there is um, every particular um, board has an actual lounge area uh, where you can um, just have consumers talking among themselves um, on their own topics. And you see it a little bit here on screen here, the idea of the red in a typical, let's say, online community, the, the red bars are the bottom-up feedbacks where consumers are just chatting among themselves without structured questions on a particular category or brand or topic. Yeah, the Denona. Uh, portal you see on screen here is also, you see clearly on the bottom left, there, there's the lounge uh, at that particular um, uh, community. So all, this is a very important uh, part, I would say, of the idea of bottom-up listening. And we frequently see in our projects that uh, new insights can arise from the lounge that the wasn't, let's say, anticipated by either us or by the client uh, in the scope of setting out the tasks and challenges, 
So it's a kind of a fresh way of uncovering or un uncovering new and fresh insights about the category. Just a couple of other things in the, in the theme of bottom-up listening or getting unsolicited or involving real listening to you, um, to consumers. It can also involve involving more people in the insighting process than you um, typically would have uh, before. So uh, the idea about frontline employees, uh, now I've just I put Carbis here as a bank. I, I mean, we could use other banks and other similar companies. The idea about, uh, let's say, employees that are directly connected to customers or consumers as being useful to um, let's say, uh, have a say in insights, consumer or customer insights, because the reason being that they're on the coalface. They're actually literally talking with consumers, with customers, and understanding their lives and what makes them tick and what their frustrations are. So how well, as a business, do we involve these employees or their learnings into our insighting process? And a little bit related to that, in many businesses, you even have customer services agents who are literally on the phone with consumers, customers, hearing about their needs, their pro problems, their desires, their questions. And um, yeah, maybe a question to you is that, you know, how, how often do, are these, let's say, the leaders of these, um, of these teams or even agents themselves invited to be part of category discussions or inciting workshops to actually present the things that they are really hearing themselves from your consumers or customers? And then finally, I think most of you are familiar with the idea of social media listening or netnography still a very valid way to get bottom-up insights. Why? Because this is all user-generated content. It has not, we have not asked them questions as a researcher. They have simply put their opinion online about categories, about brands, about issues. So this is all, let's say, unsolicited bottom-up um, opinion that is there for us to analyze, to, to look at, and as I mentioned before, start to develop observations and hypothesis and potential insights. So the idea about this being an important source of bottom-up uh, information. Okay, um, that was the first platform, um, and basically the key message of that of the previous platform was just about um, you know to really optimize insighting. There is a, a role to be played by bottom up listening, and it's more than just asking standard question and answers. We really need to listen and observe in a free and unstructured way as well. Now the second pillar, taking stock. Uh, I'm using a bit the inventory uh, metaphor here. Uh, but what is this all about? Well, um, many businesses are sitting on a gold, uh, let's say, a gold mine of insights that they already have or potential insights. But because of complexity of organizations across countries, across divisions, uh, often the business doesn't know what we already know. Um, and related to that, a clear understanding of what's left, what we don't know. Uh, so we believe that the idea of taking stock from time to time is really important. Um, so that we can focus on our research on the things that we really still have to learn and have a clear understanding of the things that we do clearly know in terms of insights or already potential insights. Now, um, yeah, as I mentioned, the idea of inventorizing, or, um, but the question again is how often do, our, do we sit together as a team and really say these are the insights we have, these are the insights we think we have, and these are the insights we don't have, or the things we need to learn. How often do we have a structured way of doing this? Now, we're finding with our customers that we are more and more doing workshops, and we have developed, let's say, an approach to this. We call it connecting the dots. But workshops where we actually engage with internal teams and really bring to life the knowledge that we have on a particular category or issue, which insights or hypothesis or observations are there that we can we say we're confident about, which uh, areas are we half confident about, we might have evidence but we need more evidence, and which aspects or insight areas do we really know nothing about. And we would do this because then as an output of all of this, we would have a clear, let's say, research program uh, centered on the things that we really still need to know. And also the idea that people in the organization might discover insights that they didn't even know existed in the business. Related to that is the idea about instead of just having physical workshops, when you are going into an inciting project, um, the idea about tapping into different people in the organization, using, for example, an online portal here, where we can literally ask people in different geographic locations, different businesses, um, business units or, or divisions, their opinion or their knowledge that they have on a particular inciting area. And we have found that uh, different stakeholders can contribute to this discussion with research that people didn't know about, with insights people didn't know about, etc. So the idea about um, collaborating uh, in this connecting the dots or this taking stock phase 
beyond the walls of your, let's say, physical workshop in a physical place um, as a best practice idea there. So that was a little bit about taking stock. Um, I'll come back to that later for questions. But the third part, ad hoc generation, I think this is the, the big chunk that most of you would be familiar with. Um, and this is obviously where we say, okay, there's a, there's a gap in knowledge we have here. There's a particular business issue. We want to get fresh insights, fresh understanding. Um, now, what we want to say here is that th what's most important here is that, um, is that you have the right methods in place to really get to all the insights. Uh, it's about finding, obviously, insights, but finding the hidden insights, the fresh insights, and making sure that the insights are really relevant. And there we think it's really about the right techniques uh, to use in this environment. Now I'm going to show a, a kind of a model on the screen, another model, sorry about that. But it's just our attempt to kind of map the ways of going about insighting uh, so that we do get to all the insights. And essentially all we're saying is that there's a difference between sort of more out of the box and in the box techniques. And there's more on the left to the right hand side, the idea about really just talking directly one to one with the, uh, with the consumer, and on the right hand side, stepping back even from the consumer in a more creative way. But we'll go through, um, we'll go through this one by one now. So, yeah, I mean the first classic approach about finding insights is to go depth, in depth with them, one on one, almost like you're on the psychologist uh, sofa. But with a really important distinction, we want consumers to not just tell their experiences, we want to, them to live them and we want to immerse in their lives so that we really see what's going on. And the great thing about modern research is that we can do that in fantastic ways by simply immersing ourselves into the actual life of the parent and uh, of, of the consumer in a, um, in a much more efficient way. Now this is just a case uh, for one of our clients, for Queenie and Dorel, where they basically needed to understand the challenges that an urban parent faces when uh, transporting young children around, um, let's say, a city or a city region. And being able to use, let's say, online platforms where um, the, the actual group you want to research can literally send you pictures, send you stories um, of them interacting with the products, interacting with the potential pain points of, of, of using these products, um, is a great way to achieve that, that deep, deep understanding of them and their lives um, through great observation and storytelling. You see a little bit the, the idea of the, of, the, of the platform here. Um, this, by the way, was something done uh, on a very much on a global level um, through different cities in the world involving different types of um, uh, parental groups. But um, I think what's really important here is that not only does the idea of this method um, better capture, let's say, uh, their lives as they're living it and interacting with the products, but by using techniques such as mobile collection, you're actually really helping to, and I think someone literally said get under the skin before when we talked about inciting. It really helps achieve that. Um, so the mobile, using mobile technology to actually capture pictures and images and stories uh, when people are experiencing your products or categories um, really adds value. And just to some, some numbers here, we saw that in this case um, the mobile users were contributing 65% uh, more posts compared to the non-mobile -mo users. And what they were contributing was, was two times more visual, more use of visuals, and actually even the stories they were giving to support the visuals, there was more text there, there was more richness. So the idea about this way of collecting, uh, getting deep understanding, is, is more efficient in that um, environment. So the next, um, the next little box we look at in how to mine insights, um, we talked with we called it Ticket Around the World, but I think the idea of, of this whole section is about zooming out to see more, about asking questions a different way, looking at researching different things, uh, to try to get to those hidden or missed insights that we might have. Um, now a really classic way that this is done, uh, and many of you may have done this, is that instead of just having discussions about a brand, um, expand that out to um, the product. but the category itself um, is important to investigate. So for the Heinz, you would talk, we would talked about sources when we did a very big inciting project for them. But going beyond that to even look at um, competing categories, to look at adjacent categories. To, uncovering insights is often about how your product is being used in, con in conjunction with other categories or how your product is being not used uh, in favour of other categories. So zoom out not just look at your own brand and category, but think about the big picture of how the consumer interacts with the particular occasion 
uh, or the need state that they're in to really get to uh, great insights. Something we do in workshops with clients when we're running inciting workshops is often even for forcing the client to adopt personas. Uh, this is a game where we say, okay, when you have um, generated observations from a research project, is let's also force the uh, client to adopt, say, a, a different personality to what they are um, in terms of age, socio-demographics, um, attitudes to life, goals, etc and ask them to think in the shoes of that person in a particular observation that context we've been talking about. This can often lead to uncovering potential new, um, let's say, frictions or aspirations that they may not have thought of before. So stepping into out of your own shoes into the, the shoes of your target consumers. Um, this is one I really like is the idea about also zooming out is to look at the world like a traveler. So I'm talking a lot. I'm going to ask you a little question is, um, What's different about us when we, when we go traveling to a new city or a new country? What, what do we tend to do differently when we're experiencing a new city or country the first time? Just give me a couple of quick thoughts. Okay, I'm good to, glad to see you're all still there. Yeah. Yes, we are all ex always excited. Paying attention to details. Yeah. Well, that's actually close to to what we what we want to point out here. So when you travel, you're really on high alert. You are indeed looking for details. Uh, when you come to a new city, uh, we're really seeing the things that are different to what we're used to. Um, for me, I look at traffic signs. I look at the way they order traffic. I don't know why, but I fa it fascinates me how they navigate around the city or signpost the city. Other people really observe the way uh, supermarkets are laid out, what kind of food and drink people have and what they don't. But this is a way of really zooming out and looking at the world like you're a traveler, looking at the consumer, looking at your um, target group um, with um, the idea of high alert. I'm on high alert looking for details as another concept here. Crowd interpretation you probably all are aware of, but it's, it's, a, it's a relevant role here. So not only do we need to, let's say, um, zoom out a bit, we also can ask um, the consumer themselves to zoom out a bit from, the, from the, let's say, giving feedback just about themselves. We can ask them to zoom out and interpret the behavior of others. So we know that this works as a method. We know that having, let's say, research participants uh, look at other participants like them and try to explain what they're doing, their observations, their findings, is a very valid way to get to more insights. In fact, um, from some of our R&D projects, up to 20 to 40% more insights can be gained simply by um, uh, using this technique of having others interpret the behavior or, or of the similar peers for them. So that's another way to kind of zoom out uh, in your insighting approach. Out of the comfort zone is just actually doing things a little bit different even from a consumer viewpoint. And I think the most, let's say, it's an old technique uh, but still very valid is the idea of deprivation activation. So why not force your, um, let's say, consumers to, let's say, eat or drink more or less of your product um, as a research exercise? Um, for Chiquita, we, we did the example where people who eat a lot of fruit were um, asked to not eat fruit for a while. Those who don't eat fruit were forced to eat fruit for a period of time. And you can have some great observations here about the drivers and barriers and the need states um, uh, that particular categories, uh, let's say, deliver to consumers. It can be very insightful using this kind of, let's say, out of the comfort zone approach to get to fresh insights. And finally, the Mars exploration. Well, I think it's the next level where we really actually even get our consumers themselves to do research projects sort of for us on our behalf. This is an example of a detective game where we actually get them, um, for example, to look for uh, content online uh, which could support the research project that we are doing. Uh, the case shown here was for Smirnoff where we sent consumers on different online missions to look for relevant social media or fan pages um, which could help answer the research question we had. So we made them almost online detectives to, kind, to try and find uh, related content to help answer the research question uh, with some games and some fun aspects to it. So just an example, something very different, but hopefully getting us to find a, 
alternative, let's say, uh, social media pages or sources of information or observation that we as researchers may not have found, but when we empowered our, let's say, consumers to go out and do that for us, they found new potential sources of research data. So just to wrap up before the next uh, section, um, you know, in ad hoc insight generation projects, it's really important to go beyond just answer, answering questions, asking questions. We really need to think about our methods and the idea about um, opening up, zooming out, uh, going for more disruptive techniques in, in getting to the true, um, let's say, insights uh, or emotions and feelings of our, of our consumers. Otherwise, we run the risk of just asking, uh, hearing everything back that we already know or have, um, believe is everything to be learnt in a particular uh, research project. Number four, insight validation. Um, this one is important and I would say that um, not all companies actually take a step to validate the insights they, uh, that they have gathered and collected over the years. Um, we do say it's a necessary step, um, mainly for the reason that um, businesses more and more these days cannot activate every insight they have. They cannot, uh, let's say, innovate on every consumer insight. They cannot make a new campaign for every insight they have. So some form of choice has to be made here and that can be difficult to do. I mean, one of the ways to do it is of course on gut instinct, uh, which ones we think are more powerful than not. But why not consider a way to actually put some kind of consumer framework over this? Or how do we choose um, which insights are more potent for us? So yeah, as I mentioned, the fuzzy front end of innovation, there's very often a need to prioritize, to choose the most potent insights um, that we would use. Um, and related to this, uh, there are many insights that we might uncover where we might simply say, well, this insight is very powerful from a consumer viewpoint, but if we look at our company and what our company can and can't do, what our company is strong at, how our company is best is set up for, maybe this insight isn't the greatest insight for us to work on or to activate on. So that's also part of this uh, particular validation of insights discussion. Now at Insights we, um, we also have used a kind of a validation method, uh, let's say method, which taps into the things that I just talked to you about before, um, earlier in the webinar about the idea of relevance, freshness, excitement. We also can measure whether people are talking about this issue to come up with a kind of a, let's say, insight strength, an overall score or a, let's say a cumulative um, feeling on how this insight scores on these different um, aspects. Um, but what I wanted to do to bring forward is that often validations are, um, are seen as uh, you know, unnecessary steps because we just, all we do is just tick boxes, we just get green light, red light and you know, we don't really understand those results. So we, we strongly believe that if we're going to validate and uh, try to shortlist our insights, it should be a very rich and robust way of doing this. So we've also explored here with ways of doing this. And, um, Cloetta is one of, our, uh, one of our customers and they partnered on an R&D project with us on insight validation to help with this. And essentially we wanted to get, obviously on screen, what you see is that you know, classically what we would deliver in an insight validation would be a lot of which ones are winning, which ones are losing, green light, red light. We wanted to go beyond that and help to explain why, things, why insights were testing well or not testing well in a quantitative environment. So we introduced the idea of um, bringing in, let's say, modules or ways of exploring in a questionnaire to really get that understanding of why insights are working or not. Um, something I mentioned earlier is that consumers themselves sometimes can't explain their own behavior or why they identify or not. Um, so why not bring in that idea of crowd interpretation we just talked about in explaining um, you know, the results that, that insights are achieving in a particular testing framework. So for example, um, what we can do is that when we're testing an insight and we see that um, uh, a lot of people are identifying positively with it or not identifying it, we can literally show the results on screen and ask the survey participants to say, how do you explain this? You know, we see that a lot of people are not identifying with this insight. Can you give your reason for this? So it's also tying into the idea of crowd interpretation and helping to bring meaning or understanding to the, um, to the results when we go to validate. What's even more exciting is the idea of when you're validating insights is why not use these consumers um, to help you already understand the context around um, that insight in a better way. So this is an example of a, let's say a task which is a follow on from a quanti survey where they're asked to give some photos which support that insight, uh, a moment that is related to that insight, contextual information to support an insight. Uh, you see on screen some actual 
uh, inputs we've got using that approach for particular categories. But it brings a richness to the, if you have a validated insight, it brings an additional richness to understanding how this insight is experienced in consumers' lives. And finally, you can even ask them, um, why not ask them to already come up with ideas to solve the particular insight? This is something that can also be done as part of a validation phase in insighting. And I have to say that, that um, yeah, there's, a, there's a view in the marketplace that only very clever, leading edge uh, innovators and consumers can come up with product ideas. We are increasingly seeing that this is not the case, that, that, that many, many uh, consumers uh, of all different kinds of sophistication can come up with great product ideas. Uh, and we received many of them in the R&D project we did with Coeta, and we were very impressed with the quality of the ideas they came up with to solve the insights they'd just been testing. So the conclusion was that doing this kind of quantifying or validating insights in a rich, this way led to a richer, a richer approach here rather than just green light, red light, um, and helps kind of a boost the ROI on that kind of research stage. All right, we're into the final, um, coming to the end, we're into the final, let's say, um, aspect of insight act of, of, of the our virtuous circle of insighting and this is one which actually is getting a lot of discussion right now um, among the let's say the industry and our clients and it's the idea of activating insights so really it's it's this on screen it's a statement but it's it sounds pretty obvious but we'd be amazed at how many cases we see where uh, businesses are sitting on a lot of insights uh, validated insights but they're not really finding their way into a business the right way. They're not being leveraged um, as well as they could be. And we see this as a really a, um, a problem area. And related to that, actually the industry is as well. So this was a bit of research I think done by Green Book asking, uh, let's say, receivers or users of market research, what are the issues they have? And several of these statements were all about the problem we have is the insights are great, but we can't get them to live in our business. We can't get them embedded in our business. What do we do to make sure we leverage them as best as possible? Um, so yeah, it's really about make, spreading the word, making sure that these insights live and breathe. So what can we do to achieve this uh, important step? Well, I mean, there's some very obvious things in the actual research uh, project itself. Um, let's say we come to the end of an insighting um, project um, is to, when we deliver the results, is to in, and do it in an inspiring way. Uh, beyond PowerPoints um, is to think about newsletters, to think about physically printed books which have pictures of the insights, stories about the insights. On the screen, uh, many of you have probably seen it, but the idea of creating an infographic, the Heineken example of where people can literally point to a particular inside area and see a short inside appear on the screen and an explanation. So making insights live in the business is about presenting them and deploying them in a very creative and inspirational way that the business has more chance um, of, uh, let's say, um, adopting those insights. Um, yeah, a provocative question, but you know, why not start a category meeting, uh, uh, let's say a, a business unit meeting, uh, an important meeting with a story on a consumer insight? Um, why not bring those insights back into the meeting um, to make sure that we remember what we're actually here for because the consumer insight is probably what your business is trying to solve uh, it, with its products services. So why not bring those stories into your meetings? Um, this is an example for Diesel where we have a very big project we did for them but the insights we learnt, um, obviously as a fashion brand they're very much able to, um, um, very much able to design things and develop things, but the insights that we, we learned from that project were actually brought to life in a, even in a physical museum. Um, so why not think about actually physically bringing those insights to life within your organisation? Speed dating. This was a great concept done with, with um, a local, the local transport um, company here, Delane, um, where at the end of the insighting project we brought all of the relevant stakeholders, not just market intelligence people, but brand people, um, innovation people, service people, to literally have a speed dating session with real consumers who took part in the insighting research. Uh, for two minutes, sit and talk about the insights, move on to the next table, move on to the next table. This makes the insights live better in the actual um, minds of the key stakeholders. The final case here is, is from ATAG, um, and this was an example where we really needed to do something radical to actually make sure that insights we gained really lived in the business. 
And the background here is essentially that ATAG, um, for those not familiar, making, uh, let's say, um, relatively high-end kitchen products, oven kitchen products uh, for the home, um, completely changed their segmentation based on research that we performed. And what they did was they went away from just making products which have a lot of buttons and more buttons and ovens which are this strong and even stronger, but designing their ovens and their kitchens around different attitudes to cooking. Are you a serious cook? Are you a social cook? Um, and what your needs are around that. So in order to make the insights that supported this new segmentation live in the organization, because it was a radical change for them, um, let the company discover these insights, re really discover them through um, various techniques. I mean, the first thing was actually uh, the environment in which uh, we we ended up creating different kitchen environments to suit these different types of cooks. These were actually replicated in store uh, in the trade uh, so that they could see exactly how these different uh, consumers would cook. Um, more pragmatically, they created an internal, uh, let's say, intranet site where all the insights were loaded up. But more importantly, pictures and stories which support um, you know, those insights are there for all internal stakeholders to engage with. So that they don't just see a written insight, they see examples of the insight in action, where it came from. So helping them to really understand the insights behind the new segmentation. Um, so related to that, the final point I will, um, and this is probably new uh, from the previous webinar, is that we, we were so, um, let's say, um, uh, concerned about this aspect of insight activation as being a need in the industry that we've actually developed a completely new um, tool to support this. It's called the Insight Activation Studio. And essentially what we want to do is help with that process, stage five of insight activation. And very briefly, what we do here is we use a, let's say, um, uh, it's not an app, but a platform which can be, um, uh, let's say, activated within a company where insights that are validated, we, we have the chance to collaborate and build and make those insights come to life better. So insights uh, that are already validated internal colleagues uh, or stakeholders might see examples which support that insight and they can simply upload stories or pictures which help build that insight. Another way to use this kind of technology is that the insights, we ask already people to come up with product ideas or solutions within the company and that can be a collaborative uh, exercise across borders, across business units, uh, but a way that the insights can visually uh, be presented in an inspiring way and that those insights can then be um, leveraged to the full extent uh, within a business. Um, so yeah, the, as you see on screen, those are the three main objectives. Um, sharing insights faster, making them work better uh, together in an organization, and ultimately, because everything I've just told you in the last 50 minutes is about potentially a very big and intense process within companies to come to great consumer insights, we really want those insights to, to increase the ROI on those insights because a lot of people have been involved, a lot of effort and potentially budget has been spent to get to those insights. We want to activate them. We want to increase the ROI. Um, so more, um, actually, this is a, a relatively new offering for us. Um, please contact me if, if you want to know more about it. Um, but we are in the process of, of um, yeah, communicating about this idea to our, to our customers. But um, it's designed to address the idea of, of insight activation. So we're nearly there, um, and I'd just like to conclude, I mean, this, this is the virtual circle again. Again, I said it's not necessarily about following these steps one, two, three, four, five in sequence. The main message was about we think all of these, let's say, processes are, or actions are important to have um, the art of inciting done really well. So my you know, question to you to go away with would be, how is your circle looking as a business? Um, you know, what could you maybe um, improve here? And for example, you might, um, you might do a lot of ad hoc generation, but you don't necessarily do bottom-up listening. Um, you might be a company that does um, a, a lot of uh, other steps and have a lot of, lot of insights on the table, but your process of, of selecting them, which ones go forward, might not be um, very robust. It might be something that's a little bit more gut feel. So anyway, just the idea to, to, to get you thinking about um, you know, where are we strong and weak uh, on the circle here? So I think we're actually at um, question time. I think we have, we still have a few minutes. I'm happy to go a little bit after five, um, but yeah, please, if you have any questions, happy to hear them. 
First of all, Ashley, thanks for sharing all these insights about insights uh, for our last uh, Smarty Summer School. Um, I already saw one question coming in during the session from Dennis. Uh, it's, is the, it is me very important in all the insights, uh, because he works in pharma, how do job dependent variables fit in? Um, yeah, I, I, are you refer I, I believe then you're referring to um, like maybe different um, professionals or different people that are involved in, let's say, a value chain within um, within a kind of a B2B environment. Did I understand that correctly? Are you still there, Dennis? I'm not sure if he is, but um, if if that's if I interpret that question question that way, I would say um, that actually often we believe insights insights can be written for in a in a B two B environment um, for everyone in the value chain, um, and typically the insights may not always be about it's me. Um, it could also be about um, what I need to keep someone else in the value chain happy. So it could be about doctors um, relating to patients. It could be about um, specialists relating to patient, uh, relating to to doctors, etc. Um, so, I am um, yeah. The the it's me. Um, it, it's generally it's generally important to have that. But what you need to have in the insight is that the person who who hears the insight says, well, I recognise that situation. It might be that the problem in, being discussed is not necessarily a problem just for me. It might be a problem for others. But I recognise that situation that's being described. And that situation being described has an impact on me in my profession or on my job. Um, so I'm, that's, that would be my take on that. But from a cons in consumer insighting, um, it's very, really, really important that they see that it, it's, it's me um, or it's, it's me interacting with the people I love or, 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 or friends or care with. So it's really that they have to see, see themselves in that insight. Thank you, Ashley, for that answer. I hope it was an answer to your question. Uh, Dennis, I don't see any other question for now, but um, should you have any other questions coming up later, you can always contact us. All the contact details are on the slide, and you will receive the full presentation afterwards as well. So I want to thank you all for joining this last Smarty Summer School of the Summer. Um, of course, we still organize uh, other Smarties events uh, in the upcoming months, so you can always check our website for that information, and then I can just wish you um, a very nice day and a very nice ending of the summer. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody.